Hey y'all, I'm Melissa Guerra. I am the Kitchen Wrangler and welcome back to my podcast. I am so glad that you're here and make sure you subscribe and make sure you tell your friends to subscribe because I need all the help or I need all the support that I can get. I need more followers. And uh, you know, I, uh, I always use a piece of paper. I'm sorry, I'm not very high tech. Uh, this is as good as it gets with me. Uh, but I wanted to tell you, I think I have about 20 followers right now. And I really appreciate every single one of you. Uh, Y'all are precious to me, just like my children who actually don't follow my podcast. So you see, we have this very special bond, you and me. So make sure you share this podcast with your friends because I need more love. And if my kids are watching, subscribe. Y'all subscribe. Okay. Okay. So today we are going to explore the question of why do Texans drink so much beer? Now, you know, there's no like caricature of Texans drinking beer, but we do seem to like it. And if you look up the stats online, which I did, we are second to California. They drink the most beer. What's up, California? I thought y'all were a wine region, but that's their problem. We love beer here in Texas. And I started wondering, why do we like it so much? So I spent a lot of time this week. I ordered a book. I ordered a book so I could study more about Texas beer. And so anyway, I thought I would share what I learned with you. One of the things I wanted to talk to you though about was food history. Now, if you are used to history being, you know, on this date, this happened and this person did this. Food history is nothing like that for, because for the most part, it, people ate food and people kind of ignored food. And so there wasn't really any great heroic battle fought for a, an asparagus or a chicken leg. You know, there was, it was just kind of the behind the scenes things that happened. So a lot of times when I say, I don't know, it's not because I didn't do my research. It's because, well, globally, I don't think food historians know everything, but the chase for the knowledge is super exciting. So just prepare to watch me geek out in full spectrum here. Uh, cause I just love this stuff. I just love discovering these little nuggets. So let's go to my ridiculous, uh, PowerPoint. Uh, so yeah, we're going to talk about beer and let's just assume that those are a couple of Texans enjoying a good brew. And so why do Texans like beer so much? Uh, you know, there's other drinks that we really like, like we really like iced tea. We lo really love Dr. Pepper. These are addictive. Uh, but they are not alcoholic. So our, we're really looking today at beer, which is alcohol, you know, gives you a little buzz, very pleasant. Um, but I want to take a closer look at it. So what are the ingredients to make beer? And I know there's a little slide you saw pop past. I will come back to that. I may seem like a scatterbrain, but I will get in all of my slides. I worked really hard on this PowerPoint. Uh, yeah. So what how do you make beer? What is in beer? It doesn't come from a beer tree or a beer river, nothing like that. Like you do actually have to make beer and the, how you make beer is with grain. Now the word grain is a very general term. Here's a picture of different types of grain. We have wheat, we have barley, we have millet, we have, what the heck is that? I think we have rice, emmer wheat, corn, and oats. So we have a bunch of different grains there and all of those can be turned into a type of beer. Now it's not always going to turn out to taste like a Coors Light or something like that, but it will be a fermented grain beverage. And the fermentation is what's going to give you that alcohol buzz. Um, so you can, like I said, you can use all of these grains for making, um, for making beer, but the two main ingredients are wheat and barley. And those grains are in my little, my little, uh, photo there. Uh, so the question is if Texans really like beer are the ingredients for making beer in Texas. And the, the answer is sort of, they're sort of here. Um, so that is barley that is malted barley 
Barley is one of the main ingredients in beer. What it means by malted is that it has been uh, steeped like a tea bag. It boiling water it and it makes the uh, grain, the barley sprout. So you can see the little sprout that's at the end of it. And what happens in the sprouting process and the malting process of barley is that it brings out certain enzymes. And then these enzymes start to work on the fermentation process. It starts taking the carbohydrates and the sugars out of those grains, whatever grains they are, and it starts breaking them down into carbon dioxide and alcohol. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. And those are hops. And these are, this is another essential element of making beer. And the interesting thing is that I found uh, with hops, it's the scientific name is who, I can't say this fast, humulus lupulus. I, I said it right. It's just, it's a weird word. Humulus lupulus. And who'd have thought it is related to the cannabis family. Now, you cannot smoke hops. Don't get any bright ideas. <laughs> Uh, but they are related way back when they're sort of like, uh, you know, but, but this is like 200 million years ago when humulus lupulus was related to cannabis. So they kind of veered off and they did their own thing through the years. So hops became hops and marijuana became marijuana. So they're very, two different things. It's kind of like uh, uh, Jimmy Carter and Billy Carter. They had the same mother. They were two brothers, but they took separate paths. So they went off and they all did their own thing. So this is another really important element for making beer as well. What it does, it does give that little bitter flavor to beer, but it also works as a preservative. So remember, so we've got malted barley, we have hops. Oops, I'm going backwards. And dagnabbit, you know, I missed a slide again. I did that last week too. This is aggravating. I am really trying so hard with this technology, but <sighs> the slide will probably be at the end of my presentation when I cannot build any drama around it. So I'm doing my best folks, but this ridiculous slideshow is getting my goat radio. All right. So malted barley hops. Now this is where hops are produced in the United States. This is nowhere near Texas. You can see at the bottom, you can sort of see the panhandle of Texas, but hops have to grow wherever it's cold. And so you can see them up in the Northwest. You can see them up in the Northeast. There's a little bit in Colorado, not all that much, but you can't grow them in Texas. So what is this? Oh my goodness. This is the slide that I was missing. All right, we're going to go back to this. But the main ingredient though, for most beer is wheat. And I had to look around and see, you know, do we actually grow wheat in Texas? Okay, I got schooled. I'm here in South Texas, all the way at the tippy toe at the bottom of Texas. We don't have any wheat around here because it is too daggum hot. But wheat does grow in the rest of the state and you can see on those little green patches, that is where the most wheat is grown. And it does grow somewhat around Central Texas. So let's go back to the ingredients of beer. So wheat, does, does Texas have it? Check. Does we, uh, does Texas have barley? Yeah, not really. I, out of the, what is it? 171 million acres in Texas, only 30,000 acres are planted in barley. And that is two tenths of 1% of our total acreage. So it's not a really significant crop. Barley is out there, but we really don't have a lot of it. And we definitely don't have hops. If we go back to our little map, we are not growing hops at, as well at either. So we can produce beer here in Texas and we do, we have some excellent Texas beers, but if you're talking about some of the original settlers that came to Texas, what would they have? What resources would they have had if they wanted to make beer? They could grow wheat, but they couldn't grow hops and they probably didn't grow barley because it probably wasn't all that product productive. So, oh, hey, and okay, so more on this map, I want you to pay attention to this. So those little green dots, that shows where the majority of the wheat is grown in the United States. And that is hard 
red winter wheat, which is the main type of wheat. You know, you may think there's only one type of wheat. You are wrong. There are so many different types of wheat. There is soft wheat for making flowers and there's hard wheat, which is used for making flowers as well. But they do different things and they make different products and hard red winter wheat is what is mostly used for beer. And so those are the wheat growing regions. So you would think, wow, well, that would be where people could produce the most beer because it's closest to the source of wheat, right? Well, that is true. I mean, Colorado has got some great beers and uh, and again, like Texas. So, um, and but I also want to draw your attention to this county in the smack dab in the middle of the state of Texas. And this is Gillespie County. And I wanted to talk a little bit about Gillespie County. And we're going to go back to the slide that I told you I was going to skip, 1845. So I want you to keep, again, you know, in the beginning of, of the podcast, I was talking to you about history, food history, and there's not a lot of dates where everything coordinates. But 1845 is kind of a big deal, a very big deal for Texas. It's a very big deal globally. So just stick a pin in that. We're going to come back to 1845. So in around 1845, well, the reason that 1845 was so significant for Texas is because that is when our state of Texas was annexed into the United States. It was a very, very important year. It was annexed like December 29th of 1845, and then all the paperwork got finished sometime in February. But it was right at the cusp between 1845 and 1846. Now, around that time, really uh, October to April 1845 to 1846, there were 5,257 Germans that came to Gillespie County to live because there were promoters who were in Germany and they wanted to set up a new Germany in the new world. And so they enticed all of these German citizens to come over to leave Germany or, you know, the, the environs of Germany to leave there and come to Texas. And so most of these people came over with the idea of starting a new Germany. And uh, I don't have to tell you how important beer is to Germans. They really like it too. I think they, li they like it more than Texas. I mean, let's be honest. Uh, so if they wanted to make their little part of Texas a new Germany, they were definitely gonna make beer, whether they could find all the ingredients next door or not, they were gonna make it happen. So if you look, here's the state of Texas superimposed over Germany, over Western Europe. Now, if I were German, I would be like, wow, you mean I can get some free land in this new place called Texas where I can make a new Germany? I would have gone for it too. So there was lots and lots of Germans that came over right at that time when Texas was being annexed into the United States. But there was another thing that was happening in 1845 that was really important and that was the potato famine. Now we've heard of the potato famine uh, as, well, okay, again with the slides, I am so <laughs> Oh Lord have mercy. Well, all 20 of y'all, I love you. I am doing my best, but dagnab it, this technology is just going to eat my lunch. Anyway, let's forge ahead. Uh, so many of us think that the, um, Irish potato famine was specifically Irish and then it ended at the Irish borders. Not the case. It affected uh, all of the region that we just saw. It affected Germany. In fact, uh, I think Belgium had one of the highest death rates uh, because the potato blight spread from Ireland and throughout all of Europe. It was kind of simultaneous. There was also some political upheaval happening in Germany as well. But there were tens of thousands of people out. There were a million people that died in Ireland because of the potato famine. There were two million people that emigrated because of the potato famine. But there was also death across Europe. Tens of thousands of people dying, dying. And all of this happened in that little cusp of time between October 1845 and 
somewhere around May of 1846. This was the beginning of the potato famine. It was the time of Texas, Texas annexation. And it was also the time that all these Germans left Germany and decided to create a new Germany in Texas. So like I said, 1845 is kind of a big deal. I am talking about beer. Hang in there. I'm getting back to it. I promise you. Uh, so, but what I'm wondering, and yeah, this, this map does have relevance. What I'm wondering, you know, the grains that we were looking at earlier, all of those could be used for making whiskey. So I'm wondering why beer is such a big deal in Texas and whiskey. We do have whiskey. There are whiskey producers now. I'm well aware of y'all before you start sending me free samples. Hey, send me free samples. <laughs> I'm not trying to talk myself out of a free sample of whiskey. Y'all just send it. Uh, message me in the comments below. And we'll talk. Anyway, uh, even though uh, they brought their desire for making beer, the ingredients for making beer is the same as for making whiskey. It all requires some type of grain. So you have to wonder why wasn't whiskey as prevalent in Texas as it was in Kentucky? You know, Kentucky ha is still, in and Tennessee, extremely famous for uh, their bourbon. In fact, I think it's, it is, it is a U.S. heritage something or other. It's like a, like a monument or it's, it's an icon. It is U.S. produced and it's iconic is uh, Kentucky bourbon, Tennessee whiskey. All of that is very iconic. But why wasn't that produced in Texas? We've got great water, which is another component of beer and whiskey. We have terrific water around Gillespie County, but why didn't they make whiskey? So goodness gracious, I don't even know if you can see on this little map, it's kind of ridiculous, uh, but you can see in Kentucky, they had about triple the amount of Irish that emigrated to Kentucky than what uh, emigrated to Texas. And again, following suit with food history, you know, I don't have firm, solid, hard facts. But I am guessing that the Germans went to Texas and brought their preferences and their knowledge for making beer. And I am guessing that the Irish had their preferences and took their ability to distill whiskey with them to Kentucky and Tennessee. So I'm assuming that that's the way that it went. Um, now this, this looks like a cartoon, it is not. Uh, this is an alembic and an alembic is a it was an invention uh invented in uh invented by uh, uh in persia by muslims and it was i've read that it was originally used for concentrating the aromas of perfume it is a scientific beaker kind of setup where you boil a liquid it goes up uh, into the top of that curved piece and the distillation then uh, evaporates off the water and then the alcohol would concentrate and flow down that little tube into another receptacle. Supposedly, they would concentrate the aroma of perfumes that way. But at some point, somebody drank some of the perfume, they got incredibly drunk, they realized that they could concentrate the alcohol level in a fermented beverage by putting it in an alembic. And there are records that alembics had been used in Ireland in monasteries since the 12th century. And I wasn't finding the same uh, research for Germany. Germany's been producing beer, which is simply a fermented beverage. Germany has been producing beer since about the year 1000. And 200 years later, or 100 years later, actually, the Irish started using this alembic to take a fermented beverage like beer, distilling it and making it into a whiskey. So it's possible that the uptick in Irish population in Kentucky led to more focus on a technique that they knew and appreciated using. And the Germans just stuck to their beer because making a distilled beverage is a two-part process. First you ferment it, then you distill it. And in Germany, the beer, well, in all beers around the world, it is simply just fermented. 
So it's a little bit cheaper too, because you have less of a process. So it was just two different people that ended up in two different parts of the United States and they had a different focus and they developed a different product with pretty much the same ingredients. So that is pretty much it. Um, let's see. Oh, a couple other things that I wanted to say though. Um, the amount of wheat that's, I didn't think that there was a ton of wheat that was grown in Texas, but apparently I was super wrong about that because there is a lot of wheat that's grown in Texas. But comparatively, um, so there's like, there's, um, there's 5 million acres planted out of our 171 million. Uh, so that's a lot of wheat. Compare, let's compare that though to Kentucky because Kentucky has 2 million acres of corn, which is a grain, but it's not wheat. So 2 million acres of corn, you think, well, that's less than 5 million acres of wheat. Hear me out. Kentucky is a lot smaller than Texas. I think you noticed that, well, I think we are, aside from Alaska, we're a really, really big state. And Texas is seven times as large as Kentucky. So if you consider, you know, uh, on a on a pro rata, on a ratio scale, if you have 2 million acres of Kentucky that is plant, is it, that is planted in corn. I'm sorry, I had to look at my notes. I need to get more, you know, I, I'm sad because I'm terrible with technology, but I'm also sad because I'm using a piece of paper. I, I need to stop being sad. <laughs> There's just sadness everywhere because I am not in control of my notes or my knowledge, but I hope that makes sense. Like you have this massive state over here growing a small, growing 5 million acres of, corn, uh, of wheat and then you have this small state over here growing 2 million acres of corn. So they're both growing what grows better. And I think what the product that they could produce, the base ingredient that they need for their respective alcoholic beverage is better produced in their, in their region. So Texas does better with wheat and Kentucky is doing better with corn. The other thing though is the weather. Texas is hot. I don't know if you've noticed, but a lot of times I'm here in the studio, I'm sweating. Uh, it is super hot uh, and it's not that way in Kentucky. So the aging process is very different in Kentucky as well. So this is as far as I got on my research between on Texas and why Texans drink so much beer. I think there's also an element of we really like it, but there has to be a reason why we always had it around. And that is always the information that I am searching for. So Thank you all for watching my crazy podcast again this week. I'm always just so thrilled that you join me. I'm enjoying the process. I'm learning a lot. I'm keeping the old uh, brain noodle sharp. And, uh, you know, I, I love food history. And I'm so thrilled that you have decided to stay here and geek out with me for a few minutes over food history, especially Texas food history. And make sure you subscribe and uh, call my kids. Tell them to subscribe, too. And uh, I think that's about it. So I'm Melissa Guerra. I'm the Kitchen Wrangler. And I'm looking forward to seeing you here on the podcast next week. Bye now.